today on GameSpot TV. We take a look at Pokemon Stadium. The game will soon be out, and it looks like there's no stopping the Pokemania. And we carry on battling with our spotlight on wrestling. There's body slamming and grapples galore as we run down the best and worst wrestling games to date. And pedestrians take cover. There's even more mayhem ahead in our strategy guide for Crazy Taxi. Stick around. It's game time. Welcome to another edition of GameSpot TV. I'm Adam Sessler. Now it's been passed off as a fad, but it would appear that professional wrestling is now a mainstay of popular entertainment. And the same can be said for the video games, which will last as long as wrestling is still popular. But what exactly makes these games tick? What makes the masses keep on returning for more sweaty, pulverizing entertainment? Ah, uh, professional wrestling. Not the collegiate or Olympic variety, but the testosterone-soaked, guts, glory, and girly girl assortment. The phenomenon has grown to titanic proportions over the last couple of years. Cable television executives devote more and more valuable programming time to broadcasting the various showdowns. And retailers worry only about how much shelf space to free up for all the different wrestling merchandise. In the past, professional wrestling has taken a back seat to sports like football and basketball. But the times, they are changing. And currently, wrestling is among the biggest of big business. Big show business, that is. It seems professional wrestling has arrived, and with it comes some potentially lucrative licensing opportunities. Video game companies who are lucky enough to hold interactive publishing rights for a wrestling franchise spend a good deal of development time trying to ensure that their game will stay true to the look and feel of their real-life counterparts. For example, why buy a WCW game if it isn't going to be stacked with real-world WCW personalities? The same is true for the WWF and its respective properties. Game fans want to see their heroes perform their signature moves. And they'll be expecting the villains to talk smack. Do you smell what the rock is cooking? But all familiar cosmetics aside, game players are expecting some serious action in their wrestling games. Professional wrestling itself is a smorgasbord of aggressive maneuvering and wild stunts. Now where grappling is well served in both wrestling and its video game counterparts, there are other relevant ING words that find their way into these types of beat-em-ups. Punching, kicking, roping, throwing, slamming, and pinning are all well represented. And additional welcome flourishes appear in the form of jumping from high places, cheating, ouch, and whenever possible, even more cheating. Tag team play and specialty arenas get a nod in the hat as well, but doing it as only video games can. The ability to create your own wrestlers and take them into a professional circuit are among the more welcome innovations. Unfortunately, the only other ing word occasionally associated with wrestling video games is, well, disappointing. But with a new year of games ahead of us, we can hope that fresh interpretations of the wrestling game will somehow live up to the excitement of the license. And as the dramas of good vs. evils and rights vs. wrongs continues to dominate our popular culture, stay comfort in the fact that in video game wrestling, unlike real wrestling, no one knows the outcome until it's over. Now, if our features only stoke your desire for more wrestling games, fear not. ECW Hardcore Revolution is out, and we have the review later on in the show. And out there on the horizon is WWF SmackDown, which you can be assured will come under our close scrutiny. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, and first, check the game news. Are the pocket monsters innocent or insidious? Reuters reports that the Catholic Archdiocese of Mexico claims Pokemon incites violence and illicit behavior in children. The Mexican Catholic publication Desde La Fe said that certain references in the series failed to take into account children's level of maturity and comprehension. If there were any questions as to whether the PlayStation 2 was going to be a success, they were answered recently when Sony Corporation was forced to shut down its company website. The server was flooded with 100,000 hits in the first minute that pre-order sales of the PlayStation 2 went online. 
Nintendo of America has announced that Perfect Dark for the Nintendo 64 has been delayed again. Originally due out on April 10th, the game has now been pushed to release May 22nd. According to a Nintendo spokesperson, the extra development time will allow the game to be everything N64 owners have come to expect. For more gaming news, always go to the GameSpot.com website. And if you want to experience more wrestling bliss, see our feature again at the GameSpot TV website. And while you're there, take our wrestling poll and let us know which game you have pinned down as your favorite. Coming up on GameSpot TV, there's speed ahead in our review of Ridge Racer 64. Now Nintendo fans can get their hands on a PlayStation favorite. And still ahead, we have a preview of Pokemon Stadium. Are you ready to do battle with Mewtwo? Welcome back. Now, the Ridge Racer series has been a popular and well-regarded arcade-style car racer for the PlayStation, and now there's a new version coming to the N64, a system with a less lustrous library of impressive car racing titles. But, put your skepticism aside, the results are pretty impressive. The first of the series to come to the Nintendo 64, Ridge Racer 64, brings the solid driving game experience to the console. Instead of being a port of the latest PlayStation Ridge Racer Type 4, this new title combines some of the best features of the series with the addition of a couple new ones. There are three racing modes to choose from, including Grand Prix, Car Attack, Time Attack, and Multiplayer. The tracks are derived from the original Ridge Racer, as well as Revolution, and there is one entirely new track to race. One of the features that has set Ridge Racer apart from other arcade racing games is the emphasis on the drift style of cornering. Ridge Racer 64 adds a drift mode that allows you to make a complete 360 while drifting around a turn. The game's graphics are not exceptionally impressive, though the single-player mode maintains a very smooth frame rate, regardless of what perspective you're using. This becomes appreciated as the tracks get faster and faster as you progress through the game. With up to four-person multiplayer, the game does begin to get choppy, but handles the speed pretty well. The music in Ridge Racer 64 lacks some of the variety of the other titles in the series. The songs generally fit the gameplay, but those sensitive to company-appointed tunes may have to turn down the music and use their own inspiring source. Overall, Ridge Racer 64 is a great introduction to those new to the series. The combination of tracks and features from previous Ridge Racer games means the N64 owner doesn't have to feel like they're jumping into the middle of something that is already established. The good graphics, tight gameplay, and arcade feel make Ridge Racer one of the best racing games to hit the console. Jeff Gertzman at VideoGames.com gives it an 8.4 out of 10. Ridge Racer 64 really is a game worthy of its namesake. Now, most hardcore gamers are probably throwing a hissy fit over the idea that Regis Philbin and his happy, simple little Who Wants to Be a Millionaire PC game is outselling every single other game on the PC market. But face it, kids, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire is the people's choice. But is it ours? Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Much like the TV show, and perhaps like Regis Philbin himself, Millionaire the Computer Game appreciates its own mediocrity and executes its blandness extremely well. All right then, let's play. The game doesn't reproduce the social drama of the TV show, but makes do with bare bones gameplay and has some of the design qualities of the developer's signature product, the much better You Don't Know Jack. Each aspect of the television show is recreated in the game in some fashion. In single player mode, you go to the hot seat, where you must ascend a ladder okay, of 15 multiple choice trivia seat. questions to win. And you're right! When you feel stumped, you have three lifelines to use throughout your climb. The 50-50 option removes two of the three wrong answers to a question. You can ask to poll the audience, or the most impressive recreation is the phone a friend lifeline, in which Regis calls one of his friends, who then struggles to offer a suggestion that may or may not be right. They said he was the all-time best, and if I'm not mistaken, I think they said his name was Peyton. So Who Wants to Be a Millionaire is a faithful, entertaining simulation of the television show. Yes! 
That's it. Oh, how about that? You're a millionaire. Steve Smith of GameSpot.com gives it a 6.2 out of 10. You're a fake millionaire. But you had a good time, didn't you? What else do you want? I want a million dollars, Regis. That's what I want. Well, let's not gripe about what we don't have and instead celebrate what we do. We have Ray from Grand Rapids, Michigan, who sent us a V-mail with his tips for The Sims. Hey, my name's Ray Weigel from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I got a cheat to get you 1000 bucks on the new Sims game. Uh, press Shift, Control, and C to bring up the cheat console, and then type in Kroposhis, and that should do it. Uh, if 1000 bucks ain't enough for you and you want more, you can bring up the cheat console again, enter exclamation, semicolon, exclamation, semicolon, over and over, and hit enter, and just watch the dough roll in. For more cheat codes, come to the GameSpot TV website. Or if you have your own cheat code or perhaps a short game review, send us a V-mail and follow Ray's lead. If we use yours on the show, you'll receive this snazzy GameSpot TV t-shirt and a chance to stun your local social circle with fashion savvy. Coming up on GameSpot TV, we party with Mario, Luigi, Donkey Kong, and Yoshi. They've thrown another party this year, and we have the review. And we have our strategy guide for the game that gets you behind the wheel in the most precarious of ways. Crazy Taxi is still to come. Welcome back. Now, for those of you who missed our Mario Party 2 review and those who want to see it again, and I know there's quite a few of you out there, we are happy to present you with an encore presentation of our Mario Party 2 review. The sequel to Mario Party doesn't change the fundamentals of the original, but it's an attempt to improve upon what players liked about the original and trim back on what they didn't. And it's more than a partial success. The original and the sequel are the video game equivalent of board games, where players take turns rolling dice to move on the playing field. The object is to earn as many stars and coins as you can. The board is spotted with random characters that can help or hinder you in your quest. But it can get more complicated when you can acquire items for additional rolls of the dice, or when you hire a boo to steal coins from an opponent. This, mixed with other random elements, keeps the game in a good state of flux. But the heart of the game are the mini-games. They occur at the end of every round and at other special times. The mini-games involve keeping a chain chomp from waking up or collecting coins thrown by a hammer brother. Sometimes we work with other players, but usually it's every man for themselves. Mario Party 2 has 40 new mini-games, with two dozen returning from the original, and gladly the most annoying ones have stayed away. While some of the less favorite are still here, there are enough games that you don't have to play them all that often. Other nice changes are practice rounds for the minigames so you can figure out what to do, and dual bouts between players who have landed on the same space. But in the end, the best part of the game are the minigames, which you won't get sick of, giving the game way more replay value. And since the game's all about replay, that's good news. Joe Fielder from VideoGames.com gives it a 7.8 out of 10. Now, with wrestling on the mind this week, it seems only fair that we check out the new game attached to the Extreme Championship Wrestling League. This is a league that tries to distinguish itself from the kiddie-friendly federations by having a grittier form of mayhem. But does it exactly translate to the game? The claims ECW Hardcore is very similar to their WWF attitude, and it's impossible to shake that feeling as you've played this game before. Except now it has different wrestlers and different sound effects. The game is lacking any of the extreme elements that distinguish extreme championship wrestling from the WWF or the WCW. Any finisher that requires an object isn't in the game, and no one's going to fly off the top rope out into the crowd. The only difference between this and Attitude is that the game is slightly faster, it's easier to toss someone out of the ring, and the language is a little dirtier. Like Attitude, the game uses the same system of grapples and reversals to keep you from using the same basic moves over and over. The game uses an advantage bar, which increases as you swing the match in your favor, making it easier to pull off grapple moves. As you wear down your opponent's health bar, you'll eventually be able to pull off a finisher. The graphics are a notch above Attitude, with nicer colors for wrestlers and arenas. The sound is good, and the 
the announcer, Joey Styles, works alone, so there's less speech to match up with the action. ECW Hardcore Revolution isn't a bad game by itself, but it in no way represents the style of wrestling that makes up the ECW. The Federation and the fans deserve something better than the same acclaim engine for three years with just a few tweaks added. Jeff Gertzman from VideoGames.com gives it a 4.2 out of 10. Now, if you want to follow your heart and see the ECW Hardcore Revolution review, or perhaps tell a friend to check it out before they buy the game, go to the GameSpot TV website and see it in real video. And while you're there, why not come by the GameSpot TV message board? There you can gripe about that game that you really, really wish you hadn't spent all your hard-earned pennies on. Coming up on GameSpot TV, we do battle with the Pokemon gang in our preview of Pokemon Stadium. And stay off the streets. We get behind the wheel of a crazy taxi. If the game is driving you mad, no worries. We have a strategy guide. Welcome back. Well, if Pokemania hasn't run you ragged, there's much to be excited about. Pokemon Gold and Silver are on their way to the Game Boy Color, and the Pokemon's most anticipated excursion onto the N64 is imminent. It's Pokemon Stadium, and here's a look. Just in case you were wondering if there was enough Pokemon goodness to go round this year, your fear should be allayed with the imminent arrival of Pokemon Stadium. Based upon the Japanese Pokemon Stadium 2, the game is pretty much a 64-bit 3D Pokemon Arena turn-based battle game. More or less an RPG without all those story character and quest elements getting in the way. In this title, you don't have to concern yourself with wandering around the countryside looking for your Pokemon. They're all right here for you to use. The game will ship with a Game Boy transfer pack that will allow you to import data and play your carefully trained creatures from Pokemon Red, Blue, and even Yellow, which was not possible in the import version. Even if you are new to the Pokemon phenomenon, you can use Pokemon available in the game. So all your favorite Pokemon are there for you to gaze at in a fully rendered and very colorful 3D world. Look for it to invade your life, Mark 7. Now, if you're interested in Pokemon Gold and Silver, come to the GameSpot TV website and check out some video we have of the upcoming titles. Now, last week we gave you a first look at the new game Knox from Westwood Studios, and we hope to have the full review for you soon. But, in the meantime, let's check out its quirky intro. Hail Sabrium and trapped in the dark. Hail Sabrium and drift on thy bark. Dark words banish thy reign is nigh. My time to bring thee home or die. Well, good tonight, Zach. My undead lords within the core, your name I hail. Enfold the orb. What the heck? Donande tak, donande tek, he rumenta la sed. Damn. Hi. You want bacon? You know I do. Damn TV. Lousy second-rate candle makers. Kill them all when I rule the world. What sort of half-baked operation do they think I'm running here? Now, where was it? Donande tak, donande tek, da da da. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I call upon the power of one dark name, one black heart, one grievous soul. I call upon the power of Lamar of Nestissimo. At last, the power of the orb is mine. Now, many of us who picked up our copy of Crazy Taxi when it came out have probably found that the joy of careening into just about anything in the game has now given way to a desire to drive with a wee bit more finesse. And it's with us in mind that we went to our friends at Expert Gamer to give you this strategy guide. All right, it's been a while since you picked that crazy taxi from the store. You've played a few levels, but you just can't seem to get that crazy rating. 
Listen up, kids. Time to stop sulking. Dry your crying eyes and buck up. I've got some insane moves to help you help yourself. The first step to mad cash is to change the way you think about Crazy Taxi. It's not a simple driving game, but a complex puzzle-like fighting strategy sim requiring split-second decision-making and ample dexterity. Make yourself one with the controller. Oh, and learn Settler's six steps to Taxi Cab Transcendence. Step one, the crazy dash. This speed burst is gotten by slamming your car into drive while at the same time stomping on the gas. The burst of speed can be helpful not only when starting from a standstill, but also to get that extra burst of speed while exiting turns. Step two, the crazy stop. Decelerating using only the brake button will waste valuable seconds that could best be used getting tips. I could do better. Thus, to stop on a dime, slam it to reverse while simultaneously braking. That's serious speed! Add this to the crazy dash, and you'll spend less time in those lonely speeds between fast and stop. Step three, the crazy drift. To turn in a hurry, crank your wheels around, slam it into reverse, then back into drive. All the while, never taking your finger off the gas. You'll begin sliding sideways across the pavement. This not only lets you take corners at high speeds, but offers your passengers a few moments of G-force induced bliss. Step four, the crazy drift jump. If you're ever in the situation that calls for turning after a jump, try this. Right at the edge of the jump, perform a crazy drift. Then turn your wheel the direction you need to be going. Tack on a crazy dash, and you've just saved precious time. Step 5. The Crazy Drift Stop. During a crazy drift, perform a crazy stop by slamming in reverse and braking. Point the car in the direction you want to be going next, and you've got yourself a super fast pickup. That was some serious fun. Finally, step six, crazy through. A crazy through is simple. Get as close to other cars, either moving or parked, and watch your tips go up. The idea here is to boost your max combo meter. Once it's at its height, you'll be getting maximum coinage from your passengers. So, there you go. Still want to absorb, and none of that easy to master. But practice and persist. That crazy license can be yours if you follow the six steps. Crazy dash, stop, drift, drift jump, drift stop, and crazy throughs. No one prepared to see. Just so easy. Well, if you want to review those crazy taxi strategies again, come on down to the GameSpot TV website. And while you're there, also check out our tips for Quake 3 and Gran Turismo 2. And also, become a part of GameSpot TV. Come join us for our online chats every Tuesday and Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern. And so until next time, bye-bye. Didn't you? What else do you want?